untouchable. A Desilu production. Tonight's episode, part one of The Unhired Assassin. Starring Robert Stack as Elliot Neff. Co-starring Bruce Gordon. Joe Mantell. And Claude Aiken. With special guest star, Robert Middleton. November 9th, 1932. At 15 minutes past midnight, Eastern Standard Time, the Associated Press from Palo Alto reported this three-word flash. Hoover concedes defeat. Three years of depression had thrust Herbert Hoover and the Republicans from control of the government and elected New York Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt President of the United States. The Volstead Act was doomed. Repeal of the 18th Amendment, prohibition, was inevitable. Let's celebrate. At 2.15 a.m. Chicago time, the Untouchables, led by their chief, Elliot Ness, celebrated the beginning of the end of Prohibition by destroying the last of the breweries operated by Al Capone and company. sell for a nickel glass when it comes back. Yeah, I imagine. Happy days are here again. Say, are we going to be out of work? Not us. Things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. I know what you mean. Frank Nitty and his boys are going to put on the pressure getting rid of their food leg stock. That's part of it. After that, they'll start some brand new operations. Nitty isn't going to quit the rackets, that's for sure. So they'll start muscling in on legitimate businesses. This will be target number one. I got a meeting in the mayor's office in the morning about it. He wants to get the town cleaned up before everybody in the world comes visiting next spring. You think we'll be out of work? Nine a.m. Miami, Florida. The same morning, the same big news. The front pages of newspapers are always devoted to important people and spectacular events. On this morning of November 9th, 1932. There was certainly nothing newsworthy about a small man who wandered aimlessly down a Miami street. Giuseppe Zangaro is an emigrant from the south of Europe. He had come to Miami from Patterson, New Jersey, where he didn't like it because he didn't feel good in cold weather. It hadn't helped much because Joe Zangara never really felt good any place. He had gone to the hospital once to try and find some relief from the pains which constantly tortured his insides. The doctor said they could find nothing wrong with him. Had his doctors pursued their analysis, it would have become evident that Joe Zangara had pronounced homicidal tendencies. Hey, read all about it. Get your extra here. Paper, paper. Read about your new president here. Paper. Thank you, ma'am. Hey, you got a new president. Hey, hey, hey. What that mean? What that mean? It means just what it says. Hoover's out, Roosevelt's in. We got a new president. Hey, extra here. Extra. I don't got to kill Hoover. No, no, you don't gotta kill Hoover. <laughs> Democrats did it for you. Hey, get your paper here. Thank you, ma'am. Hey, paper, extra here. It's Roosevelt. It's now Roosevelt. Do me a favor. Don't kill him, will you? At least not until we find out what he's gonna do to us. He do the same, they all do the same. It makes no difference. Bosses, kings, presidents, is all the same. Big people is all the same. It's big money. Yeah, yeah, sure. Hey, paper here, get your paper. He's in Washington, this Roosevelt. No, no, he ain't in Washington. He's home with his family. And this morning, they're all celebrating by taking baths and champagne and big money. Hey, paper, come on, get your paper here. Right, where he live, Roosevelt? Where he live? How do I know where he lives? For two cents, you can find out right here. Paper here. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hey, get your paper here. Paper. It's two Please. cents is here. It's one cent, two cents. 
big money. Hey, paper here. Get your paper. Yes, sir. Read all about it. You got a new president here. Hey, paper. Hey, paper. Hey, paper. Nothing newsworthy about little Joe Zangara on this November morning. But before the passing of many weeks, this man's name and likeness would be on the front pages under screaming headlines. And the word that would identify his photograph would be assassin. Chicago, the same morning of November 10th, 1932. Along the lakefront, a great project was under construction. The Chicago World's Fair, to be known as the Century of Progress Exposition. In City Hall, the latest developments regarding the exposition were being reported by Chicago's chief executive. At 9 a.m. on November 10, 1932, the mayor of Chicago, Anton J. Cermak, held his weekly press conference. And that 75 million people will visit the Chicago Century of Progress. In other words, do you know how much money will come into the city next year? One billion dollars. Pretty impressive, huh, Mr. Ness? Very impressive, Your Honor. And that brings us to something else. When you've got big money, you've got big problems, right? Mr. Ness is the man mostly responsible for the fact that Al Capone is in prison. And he and his organization have continued to wipe out rats' nests all over the city. Maybe Mr. Ness will tell you about the big job he's got coming up now. Well, there can't be much doubt that a century of progress and all this money that's coming in represents a real big juicy thing to the gangster elements. It couldn't come at a better time for them. Repeals on the way, the days of bootleg and gin mills are numbered. So the job his honor's talking about is to get Chicago cleaned up and free of rackets before these millions of people get here. So they'll see us as a kind of a town we used to be before these 13 years of prohibition. Think it can be done, Mr. Mayor? It's got to be done. Capone is out of the way. The big rat is in the cage. And now the smaller rats, the puppet rats that used to jump when Capone pulled the strings, they will be exterminated. Hold it, Mr. Mayor. Grab that. The next day, in the old Capone office over the Momot Cafe, a meeting was being held by the puppet rats, referred to by the mayor of Chicago. Louis Little New York Campania, assigned to organize protective rackets at the World's Fair. Frank Diamond, specializing in prostitution management. Protege and devoted disciple of Al Capone. One of the original Capone gunmen, Jake Dodo Ryan, hoodlum, untalented but obedient. Bill Skidmore, businessman, promoter, a consulting expert at emergency sessions. And Frank Nitti, known as the Enforcer, Al Capone's hatchet man, holding sway over the organization while number one was in Atlanta as a guest of the government. A fat, stinking Bulgarian coal miner. Bohemian. Shut up. Don't give me corrections. I want to know something, I ask. I shut up and let me think what to do. Frank, cut it out and sit down. You're going to give yourself a headache. Nobody wants to know my solution? Anytime a man gives you a problem, you have one invariable solution. Bump him off. That's right. Bump him off. What's wrong with my idea? Frank, you can't trust your friends anymore like you used to. You plan something big like bumping off the mayor. It's bound to get around. And the first thing you know, somebody sings. Yeah, too many guys need to cop a plea today. You know what I mean? Then they'll really have something on us. Then what'll happen? The blue bellies will come up and close this shop for good, and we'll all have to go down and live with Al Capone. Frank, will you please listen to my advice now? All right, I'm listening. What is this advice? Out of town talent. I got a man coming, should be here any minute, from Boston. A gun? Huh? A gun. A lawyer. Top man, Ira Peterson, very smart. Handled some things for our people back east. Uh, what do we need a lawyer? To make a deal. We form a dummy corporation, include Sir Mac in. He doesn't know it's us. The whole thing is handled from Boston. Offer him a chance to make a couple of hundred grand. Sign him up, and then he's got to cooperate. I have a feeling this might work. Well, I haven't. 
I got a feeling Sir Mac isn't going to get shot up except by something that talks louder than he does. Like one of these. Also from out of town. If we need artillery, we import it. Gentlemen, I'm Mr. Peterson. I understand we have problems. But perhaps, as President Coolidge said, our most important problem is not to secure new advantages, but rather to maintain those we already possess. <laughs> well, gentlemen, time is money. Shall we begin? On the night of December 14th, 1932, in the library of Mayor Anton Cermak's home, lawyer Ira Peterson had his meeting. Your Honor, I represent certain Boston clients whose names at present I am not at liberty to divulge. Now, these gentlemen are interested in forming a syndicate to manage and direct the World's Fair here in Chicago. Assuming, of course, all responsibilities for franchises, taxes, etc., etc., etc. Now, this syndicate would operate under Your Honor's direct personal guidance. Since it would be invaluable to have the benefit of your great experience in administration. Go on, Mr. Peterson. Well, sir, as evidence of good faith, we are empowered to make a substantial down payment to any account or any bank that you care to designate. Of what do you think so far, Your Honor? You really want to know? Oh, yes, yes, of course. I think it's a big, fat bribe. A scheme to muscle in on legitimate business and to get the mayor of Chicago in a trap at the same time. I'd be an idiot to listen. A proposition like this coming from unknown clients. Oh, really, sir, I told you I'm not at liberty to divulge the names. Well, I am at liberty to divulge the names. They are Nitty, Skidmore, Capone and Company. And they don't operate in Boston. They hang out right here in Chicago over a small building on South Street. We keep pretty close tabs on that building, Mr. Peterson. You were seen going in and coming out some weeks ago. What buildings I go in and out of are my own affair. Now, is it bothering you, the fact of accepting our proposal while you're still in office? You think I should resign and accept your proposition as a private citizen? Well, yes. It would certainly remunerate you far more handsomely. You're, uh, you're 60. You could take it easy. Mm -hmm. Now, this I find very interesting. I thought you might. Yes. But what reason would I give for resigning? Ill health. Perfectly logical. There's precedent. Yeah, it's very interesting. You know why? Because it would mean that when I got out of the way, you fellows would have to be very sure that whoever followed me in as mayor would be one of your people or someone that you could buy. So to save the city from that, I think I just won't resign. Mr. Mayor. I have before me a list of what a duly authorized investigatorial committee might recognize as misuses of power on the part of a public official. Now, these facts cover your actions as a precinct captain, your manipulations of the 12th Ward, and, oh, yes, your organized racial bloc called the United Societies. 
Now, we can produce witnesses who... You're wasting your time, Boston lawyer. These things you dug up about me, they printed that stuff in books. You can buy it in a bookstore. A politician does many things. But I can tell you this, I've never been in jail. And that's more than you can say for your client, Frank Nitty. No deal, Mr. Peterson. Tell Nitty to go fly a kite. Is that your final word? No. Good night. Yes. By the way, I ran into some interesting facts during my research in Chicago. Apparently, it's unlucky to be mayor of this city during a World's Fair. Did you know that the last World's Fair mayor of Chicago was assassinated? All right. You ask for it, now you're going to get it. You're going to be served with a summons to appear and answer charges. Charges of attempted bribery blackmail, et cetera, et cetera, and threatening the mayor's life. And when you talk, Nitty and company will be set up. And that's a promise. And that seemed to draw blood. He became very, very angry. He said he was going to serve me with the avowed intention of preferring charges. What charges? Mm -hmm. Tempted bribery, suborning, conveying the connotation of a threat to his life, but he obviously won't go through with it. You don't know that Bulgarian. Suppose, uh, just suppose he did serve this subpoena, whatever it is. What would happen? Mm -hmm. I'd have to appear and testify, but... Uh... And tell the names of the people who hired you. Well, if you carry it that far, yes. I suppose a committee could, under the pain of contempt of court, force answers to... And we would go to jail. How big a rap? Oh, come now, Mr. Nitty. Let's not carry this to ridiculous extremes of conjecture. I tell you what we do, Mr. Peterson. Let's play safe, huh? I think we get you out of town. You're probably right. He won't serve the papers, but... Just in case, you know? Yeah, that's press, Mr. Peterson. If you ain't around, he can't serve you with anything. There's a plane out here in an hour. A couple of the boys will drive to the airport. Who's got a car? I got mine downstairs. Hey, Louie, won't go long? Sure, I'll go long. Well, I don't suppose there is any more I can do here at present. <laughs> I want to get home for Christmas anyway. Still have some shopping to do. Sure, we all let it go to the last minute. We'll be in touch. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Peterson. Have a good trip. Feels like we got a flat tire. Yeah, I hope not. Let's take a look. Everything all right? Front ones are all right. Stepping outside and giving us a hand, Mr. Peterson. I think we got a flat tire in the rear. Well, I'm afraid I wouldn't be of much help. No! Come on, get out! Take your hands off me! Wait! What do you think you're doing? You out of your mind! Oh!
him. How long will it take him to get back to Boston? Could take years. He'll never make it for Christmas. <laughs> to the untouchables. Herr Hitler is saying, I have advanced with my shock troops and have placed myself at the head of the government to lead the German people to liberty. And so Adolf Hitler accepts the chancellorship, although on less sweeping terms than he had hoped for. The composition of the new German cabinet leaves Herr Hitler no scope for gratification of any dictatorial ambition. Happy birthday to the president-elect. Franklin Delano Roosevelt is 51 years old. The president-elect cuts an eight-pound birthday cake in the presence of patients and staff members of the Warm Springs Georgia Foundation. Joe Zangara's savings had dwindled to $43, all he had in the world. He was living in the attic room of a boarding house, for which he paid $2 a week. And he had found a restaurant where he could eat for 15 cents a day. Joe Zangara had once been a good workman. He earned good money, but nothing was left of his will to work. Nothing was inside him but a constant aching torment, a misery which he believed in his twisted soul could be relieved only by the death of the leader of the nation. In Chicago, a group of assassins to whom money was no object in accomplishing the murder of the man they had marked for death. Early in February 1933, two out-of-town gentlemen arrived at the Capone office for a conference. These expensive experts were known front face and profile to the police of Detroit and the North Central States as Milwaukee Minnelli and Rowley Sutton. All right, let's get down to business. You know who we got in mind. This guy's Cermak. That's right. It's pretty big stuff. I never did one that big. Well, that's why you're getting big money. Sure, that's always good. We got some news ought to make things a lot easier for you. We did some research. Finding out what he does. Like his habits, you know? Any objection to daytime? Don't make much difference. Nighttime's better, but if you got a good daytime habit, that's okay. A very good habit. Right around the corner from the mayor's office is a little coffee shop. He goes there every morning, takes a breather from the office. Every morning? Seems to be. Sounds good. I'll check for a few days, work up a timesheet. That's best. How about the limousine? Whenever you want it. Holy mackerel, look what time it's got to be. Uh, they closed at 9 o'clock, a dry cleaning joint over here. I ain't made my collection there yet this week. Well, go get it. Dope. See you later. What's the matter with him? All the time behind with his collections. I don't know. I think he's got girl trouble. All right. Where were we? Sorry, we're closed. Hello, baby. It's me. I'm afraid I can't let you in right now. If you're closed, that's even better. This is just a social call. Mr. Ryan, I've told you before that there's no use for you. Baby, you ought to be nice to me. I collect a lot of money around here. People all the way up and down the street are paying me good money to be protected. Now, have I ever mentioned money to you? No. Please go. That's because we could work out a little arrangement, something personal, you know? No, it won't. In the first place, I'm a married woman. Yeah. And your husband keeps going away on trips. I don't buy that, baby. Why don't he come back? He came back, mister. I'm the missing husband. You satisfied? Good night, mister. We're closed. You don't say. 
Yeah, come on out. Let's go. Don't come back. Mighty high and mighty for a pants presser. Beat it. Make me. See me again, buddy. Jake Dodo Ryan, a hoodlum, a bully, had taken a well-deserved licking. An incident seemingly unrelated, which was to have a profound bearing on a matter which meant life or death to the mayor of Chicago. After learning the details of the meeting between Cermak and Peterson, Elliot Ness assigned untouchables William Youngfellow and Jack Rossman to guard the mayor. Barney! How are we today? Oh, couldn't be better. <laughs> I'm expecting a friend for breakfast. Uh, can my Hans and Fritz, my two cats and my kids, uh, have this table, maybe? Why, surely you sit right down, sit right down. I'll be right with you. Thank you. Oh. Uh, coffee? That's fine, thank you. Me too, and uh, one of those cakes, please. Ah, coffee and cake, right away. Mr. Ness. Your Honor, sit down, please. Thank you. How's he been treating you? Can't complain. He's tried to lose us a couple of times. So we're sticking close. Sticking close? Like a couple of court plasters, that's how close. I have now absolutely no privacy at all. Well, he wanted to be a public servant. <laughs> this is very pleasant. Yes, isn't it? I come here every day. But what did you have? You like cake? Oh, I don't know. I had breakfast a couple of hours ago. So did I, but that was like us. Burn up lots of energy. You have to restoke the furnace once in a while. Oh, a cup of collage for my friend, Mr. Ness. This is Mr. Svoboda. How do you do? How do you do? Fine. Well, how goes the World's Fair? Well, pardon me. The Century of Progress Exposition. Great. Everything's working fine. I was going to ask you, uh, have you heard any more about that Boston lawyer? No, not a word. Neither did I. And things seem quiet with the nitty bunch. Yes. You think too quiet? Could be. Oh, here we are. Oh, that looks ah. fine. Ah. <laughs> I'm going to gain another five pounds. Oh. The kids will kill me. Oh, yes. <laughs> you have children, Mr. Ness? Yes, one. A boy. A boy? Oh, that's wonderful. You know how long I was married? 34 years. I've got a daughter, though, as you. Well, that'll be quite a trick. I'm 35. <laughs> was your wife from Bohemia? 
No, from here. Met her when I was working in the coal mines. Next time I saw her, I was in a restaurant, but she didn't recognize me. My face was clean. Before, I looked like Al Jolson or somebody. <laughs> uh, you've come a long way since then, Your Honor. That's the kind of a country this is. A fellow can do it if he's willing to keep plugging away. Yeah. I wouldn't want your job. Well, I wouldn't want it either. It hadn't happened to work out. It's tough. But, like we have an old bohemian saying, to a tough steak comes a sharp knife. We should be getting back, Your Honor. Me too. Mrs. Oberler. Yes? On my bill, please. Sure. It was wonderful. I'll be back. Thank you. I'm glad. Oh, thank you. <laughs> See you tomorrow, Mrs. Sorbonne. Your table will be here like always, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a politician. You can accuse me of a lot of things, but I've never yet got votes by kissing babies. <laughs> Thanks again, Your Honor. See you soon. Well, boys, take good care of the mayor. Who's that for? Some friends of mine. Oh, the dry cleaning shop, the ones that gave you trouble the other night, huh? They're the friends. What is it? Nitro? Ah, uh, some new stuff. It's not better than nitro. Get that for me, will you, Frank? Them. I think we're all set. For when? Tomorrow morning. No kidding. That's right. It's all here. Monday, he arrives 9.38. He leaves 10.05. Tuesday, he gets there 9.44. Leaves 10.14. Today, 9.39. Came out of the coffee shop at 10.10. Notice the pattern? Never gets there before 9.30. Never leaves until after 10. Stays an average of 20 minutes. Stays an average of 22 minutes, 17 seconds. Never gets there before 9.38. Never leaves before 10.05. Genius. So what's the perfect time for us? 9.50. <laughs> At 9.50, there's going to be a big noise on the Rotney Street. There's going to be a big noise on South Street, too. 9.50. Finito to that Bulgarian. Nice work, boys. Let's break out the drinks and celebrate. Now you're talking. on the morning, planned for the murder of Mayor Cermak, Elliot Ness and Allison of the Untouchables paid a visit to the elite dry cleaning shop. Good morning. I'm Elliot Ness. Oh. This is Mr. Allison. How do you do? We had a report that you had some trouble with a man who works for Protective Syndicate. Yes, well, I uh, think you better talk to my husband, Tom, about that. Tom, would you talk to these gentlemen about the man you had the fight with? You bet I will. 
This is my husband, Tom Jensen. How do you do? Have you been paying protection money, Mr. Jensen? No, that's the trouble. This big mug is sweet on my wife, and I didn't know about it. I've been away back east. Well, she tried to handle him, keep him at a respectable distance. Well, the other night he comes in, and unfortunate for him, I'm here. I just came back. So we had a big fight, and I threw him out. Can you describe him? Oh, easy. He was a big guy, had a droopy left eye. Looked like a fighter or something. Jake Dodo Ryan. All right, I'll give the officer on the beat Ryan's description, and we'll keep a general watch out. Thanks. You bet. So long. Don't worry, honey. Everything's going to be all right. for me. Okay. How about that? Pretty good catch, huh? One hand. Give me back my ball. Sure, kid. Hey. Hey, kid. Want to make a quarter? A quarter? Sure, see? Now, all you got to do, come here. You see that pants pressing joint over there? The elite shirt. Huh, okay. You take these pants over. Tell him the old man wants some hot press by machine in a hurry. That's all? And I get a quarter? Well, I like you, kid. Hot press by machine in a hurry, right? I'll wait for you here. You know what? Because I like you, when you come back, I'll give you another quarter. Gee. OK, on your way. Watch yourself from the traffic. him around now that you mention it. The uh, great big guy with a droopy lid. Looks like a fighter. That's him. Hello, Mrs. Jansen. Well, hello, Albert. How are you? Swell. Is Mr. Jansen in the back? I got these for him. Well, yes. Go ahead back, honey. How's your mother? Swell. Hi, Mr. Jansen. Oh, hi, Albert. My old man went to steam press these for him in a hurry. Your old man, Albert? Is that a nice way to talk about your dad? Put him here. So he wants a fast press, huh? Well, we aim to please. Albert, take this out to Mrs. Jansen, will you? Sure. And hold it up high so it don't get dirty. Oh, thank you. What did you get for your birthday, Albert? A chemical set in a submarine. Uh-huh. Oh, listen, if you're going to bounce the ball, why don't you go out in front and wait? OK. Hey, mister, are we gonna wait around here all day? Just a couple of minutes more, buddy. Hey, ain't that the guy? Come on, get going. Get me out of here! Guys, I didn't do nothing.
That's him. I don't know this kid. I never seen him before in my life. Get him off me. It's first degree, Ryan. Murder first degree. You'll get the chair. No, you can't. A deal. Let's make a deal. Bail downtown. No bail, no nothing. I'll sign it. No, I think, look, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how Sir Mike. Rico, bring the car around, will you? What's going to happen? Is it a deal? You do right by me and I'll tip you. Straight stuff. They're going to kill the mayor. I swear it. Okay, it's a deal. When? Where? Any minute. What time is it? 9.30. 20 minutes. Machine gun from a limousine. 9.50, I swear it. Where? I don't know the name of the place. He has coffee there every morning. Swobitas. Take him downtown. Hey, what, what happens to me? Just like I said, you go up for murder first degree. No, you made a deal. Did I? You lousy, stinking cop. It's a double cross. It's a stinking double cross. That's what it is. How does it feel? <laughs> Three minutes. How fast you want to be going? Pretty good clip. Okay, I'll take it around the block once, get up a little speed. Yeah, good. Katsunyama's the uh, same as always? The same. We're a little late this morning, aren't we? No, just about the same time as always. Next block. Here's what we do. You slow up in front and I'll run across. You guys back up and block the street. The coffee shop's on the downtown side, so that's the side they'll be on.
Nobody got hurt? I guess it's all over. I got no words to say. You were lucky. I'm sorry, Mrs. Forbes. We'll fix this all up for you. Maybe I better not come back again. Nobody left to talk? Nobody. The first attempt on the life of the mayor of Chicago had failed. But there would be another attempt. More hired assassins would be put to work on the project, which by now had become the obsession of the Capone gang. And in Miami, Florida, to an unhired assassin with an obsession for the death of another man came momentous news. Pawn shop, Joe Zangara for eight dollars, bought a revolver and ten bullets. A 32-year-old bricklayer turned derelict had become the principal actor in a drama whose final scene would be witnessed by an audience of 10,000 people. Untouchables, 